and uh, turn over there to Second Kings, Amen, twenty second chapter. We need the Lord to come by here and help us <clears throat> in a great way. I felt like the Lord dealt with me this morning concerning these scriptures. These scriptures came to me a few weeks ago. I kind of just jotted them down. I didn't really look into it a whole lot, just kind of jotted them down. But I felt impressed of the Lord to revisit these scriptures again this morning while I was praying. And... Uh, <clears throat> tell you what, I want the will of God in my life, don't you? Amen. I want the hand of God upon my life. Amen. I appreciate him so much. I I just want to read a story here about a king by the name of Josiah. Amen. There's a lot of good things here that the Lord will help us. I'm going to try to pull out for us today. I want you to keep your minds and your hearts upon God. Amen. I like to see the Lord move. Amen. We've had... Man, we've already had how many? Six, seven, what, eight filled with the Holy Ghost already? Eight or nine, maybe? How many have we had saved already? About six saved? I mean, it's, the Lord's definitely working here. The Lord's definitely trying to help people this week. Amen. I'd like to try one more time to push out here and see if maybe it won't be your day. Amen. Would that be all right? Amen. Let's start reading here in verse number uh, one. We're going to read about 11 verses here. I know it sounds like a lot, but it's not that much. Amen. This will probably be your Bible reading for the week. (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) All right. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 30 and one years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jedidah, the daughter of... Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you. This has got a lot of those. Yeah. (laughs) Words. <coughs> the daughter of Adiah of Boscath, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in all the way of David his father, and turned not aside to the right hand nor to the left. And it came to pass in the eighteenth year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azalah, the son of Meshulam, the scribe to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door hath gathered of the people. And let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord, and let them give it to the doers of the work which is in the house of the Lord to repair the breaches of the house. And to the carpenters and builders and masons and to by timber and hewn stone to repair the house. Howbeit there was no reckoning made with them of the money that was delivered into their hand, because they dealt faithfully. And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and read it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house, and have delivered it to the hand of them that do work, that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, that he rent his clothes. Amen. <clears throat> Yeah, I was reading here about Josiah, and to really appreciate and to really get a full understanding about what has taken place in this 22nd chapter of the book of Kings, you have to back up a little bit into the next chapter, into chapter number 21, and you have to read that chapter, and you have to realize where Josiah is coming from. Amen. As we read this, the Bible said that he was eight years old when he began to reign, and that he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And he walked in all the ways of his father David, and he turned not from the right hand nor to the left. Now to really appreciate that, you've got to realize who his heritage was, what his lineage was. Josiah's great-grandpa was Hezekiah. 
And we all know the story of Hezekiah and how the Lord had added 15 years upon his life. However, the Lord had proclaimed that judgment was going to come, but it was not going to come into the days of Hezekiah. So then we read how that uh, <coughs> Josiah's grandpa, Manasseh, and then began to reign in Israel, and began to reign in Jerusalem after Hezekiah. Now we begin to see the judgment and some of the ungodliness and the evil that was going to start to besiege the land through the sons of Hezekiah. And so we read about Manasseh, and if you read and study about Manasseh, the Bible says that he seduced Israel to do more evil than all the nations that the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And he was a wicked individual. And the Bible says that he caused his sons to pass through the fire. Amen. He, uh, he delved in enchantments, and he dealt with familiar spirits, the Bible says, and with wizards. Amen. Just to try to sum that up for you, he was a wicked man. Amen. He did not follow after the paths of God. Amen. He followed and served after idols. Amen. He chased after familiar spirits. Amen. And got involved in what they call the curious arts. Amen. And witchcraft and, and idol worship and idolatry. Amen. Amen. But then along came Amnon, which was Josiah's father. Amen. And the Bible says that he acted just like his father Manasseh. Amen. He did the exact same things. So here we have a history of two generations. And out of that same lineage, out of that same ancestry, came Josiah. But Josiah, amen, was following after the Lord. Now you got to think about this for a minute. Two generations of wickedness, according to what we've read, they've left the house of God in ruins. The house of God's become dilapidated. But in Josiah's 18th year, 18th year, he sent men with provisions to begin to repair the breaches in the house of the Lord. Somewhere in the midst of those ruins, in the midst of all that dilapidation and all that decrepancy, and then somebody found a book. Amen. And it looked like an important book. And they brought it back to the king, and they read that book within the king's hearings. And the Bible says it was the book of the law, which to us that means it was the word of God. They didn't have the black back book like we have right now. Amen. They just had the, the laws, amen, and, and, and the things of, the, of that nature. That's all they had back then. That was their God. That was their Bible, if you will. That was their word of God. And they somehow, in the midst of all that ruins, amen, somebody stumbled upon the word of God. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Hallelujah. Oh, it's going to get better here in a minute if you help me. Well, it'll get better if you don't help me. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm trusting God. Amen. Right in the middle of all that turmoil, somebody found the Word of God. And they took it back to the king. They said, Josiah, in the midst of all of our repairs and buildings, I mean, I don't know, it don't say where he found it. I'd like to think it was somewhere in some old library, some old preacher's office, amen, some old priestess quarters, buried underneath a bunch of broken down bookshelves, amidst a bunch of dust and cobwebs, and then they dug it out of there, they said, read this, Josiah, we begin to read the words of this, and it begin to prick our hearts, and the Bible says that when Josiah heard the words that that book spoke, that he rent his clothes, it smote his heart, when he began to hear of the terrible things that happened to a people. Amen. That turn away. Amen. From the will of God. That turn away from the work of God. Josiah got concerned. He said, Go find a prophetess. Go find somebody. Go pray. Let's inquire to God about the words that are written within this book. He got to sizing up the situation around him. And he said, Boys, it don't look good. It don't look good. My granddaddy did it wrong. My daddy did it wrong. And according to this book right here, God's not going to wink at it. There's going to be retribution. There's going to be judgment. Somebody tell me about the words in this book. Yeah. 
So they went down to the prophetess's house and inquired of her concerning the book of the law. She said, surely the Lord's going to bring evil, amen, upon the inhabitants for all their wickedness. But because this king, when he heard the words, rent his clothes, and he humbled himself, and not only that, but he took the initiative to inquire about what this book says, I'm going to spare him. It's not going to happen as long as he's reigning. Come on in here now. Are you hearing me? I begin to look at this. And I begin to think, Lord, oh, how the mountain that uh, Josiah had to surmount. I mean, you think about it. He came from a history of men that did nothing but wickedness. I mean, I mean, when you were away from the, the Lord for two generations like this man was, you begin to forget about the ways of God. And then you begin to, begin to, begin to forget about the worship of God. And then you begin to forget about what it was like to serve God. I mean, it's been two long generations since anybody ever worshipped in the house of God. It had been two long generations since anybody ever sang praises. Since anybody ever lived according to that book. There was wickedness everywhere. There was idols everywhere. There was ungodliness everywhere. Yet in the midst of all of that, somebody saw a light in the house of God. Somebody found the word of God. And they tried. It. They poured it to their heart. And they said, I will be willing to live by the words in this book. So God, two generations, that's a long time. Think about it. Think about it. Think about today and pray. Let's inquire to God about the words that are written within this book. He got to sizing up the situation around him. And he said, boys, it don't look good. It don't look good. My granddaddy did it wrong. My daddy did it wrong. And according to this book right here, God's not going to wink at it. There's going to be retribution. There's going to be judgment. Somebody tell me about the word in this book. So they went down to the prophetess's house and inquired of her concerning the book of the law. She said, surely the Lord's going to bring evil, amen, upon the inhabitants for all their wickedness. But because this king, when he heard the words, Rent his clothes and groves where idol worship was happening. Oh, he said, we saw the sacrifices to ungodly gods of wood and stone. There was no spirit. There was no direction. There was no guidance. But somewhere over in Solomon's temple, there was a light shining amongst the ruins, amongst the rabble. And somebody took the initiative to find the word of God. And Josiah said, I'm a Lippite. Let's look at it in a natural sense. They say most of the time, the reason why a man is an alcoholic is because his daddy was an alcoholic. Huh? And then his father was an alcoholic. Nine times out of ten, because the sin that's in some of our lives and was in some of our lives, is that we, we was a product of our environment. Uh, you know why I pity people that's in gross sins? Because a lot of times they're in that sin because that's all they know. They don't know nothing else. Some people was raised up. We come to camp meeting. They was raised up in a bar somewhere. Huh? I mean, well, a boy that, was, uh, that used to go to church, he's backslid now. God help him. Amen. He tell me stories of eight, nine years old. Amen. A laying underneath the pool table while his daddy was brawling, fighting, carrying on. Oh, come on here. I mean, the peoples and products of their environment. Come on here now. But here's Josiah. He's completely different.
sometimes we reverse that equation. We're raised in the house of God. We go to camp meetings. We go to revival. We go to fellowship meetings. <laughs> we think we'd be products of our environment. <laughs> but sometimes we're just completely different. Ooh, that'll preach. <laughs> huh? I mean, girls, you would think being raised in the house of God, you'd want to worship God. Huh? Boys, you'd think being raised in the house of God, you'd want to go after God. Huh? I mean, all the miracles. Uh, I, I actually, you know, everybody's been here. They know everything about all this, you know, hanging up back here. But one of them little kids come up to us, me and somebody else, I can't remember who it was now. Who? It was Brady? Brady. Yeah, little Brady. And I caught him when he was awake. <laughs> He come on up to the pew, and he's just staring at that board, brother Lloyd. He's just staring at it. You was next to me, wasn't you? And he was like, well, what's that? Well, what's that? Well, what's that? What's that? So, you know, me and brother Kendall was telling him, you know, explaining him a couple of these things that was kind of going on in his life. Over there at Diagnostic, from the do- whatever it's called, <laughs> from the doctor, <laughs> that piece of paper, amen. Yeah, <laughs> amen. That was added since we uh, had this youth camp. Somebody healed a cancer. So I begin, you know, we begin to tell him about that. You know, it's shot back. Somebody had tuberculosis. And, of course, the eyeglasses are pretty self-explanatory. Amen. And you got the, the, the shoe heel. Someone had a bad feet. Amen. And, and then I believe that's Sister Kathy's there, if I'm not mistaken. Amen. How the poison racked through her body. She should have been dead. Amen. But God just delivered her. I mean, you'd think being raised with all of this heritage and tradition... That we'd want to serve God. I mean, all the miracles. If we took the time today to have people stand up amongst us, they would tell stories of healings. They would tell stories of how I was going down for the last time, but God brought me out. Brother Terry, I believe a few years ago, your wife stood up and told the testimony about how before you got saved, y'all's marriage was about to go. You was about to lose it all. But God come right down and put it all back together. I mean, we've got all kinds of, we're compassed about with a great cloud of witness, aren't we? I mean, you would think, being raised up in the house of God, having all these testimonies, We have the Word of God. It's not hid from us. It's not buried and dilapidated. You would think we would have a desire and then to go after a God that's able to do all that. Oh, but oftentimes it's not. That's not the case. But I'm talking about a boy that didn't have all that. He didn't know what a healing was. He didn't know what a miracle was. He didn't know what salvation was. He, all he knew was idol worship. All he knew was witchcraft. All he knew was ungodliness. But in the midst of all that, the Word of God. Oh, in the midst of all that, the Word of God shone like a lighthouse. Got a hold of that boy and caused him to turn to God. I'm feeling the Holy Ghost get a little closer here. In the midst of all that, there was something down inside of him that was drawing him to the house of God that he couldn't explain. Oh, God. If there was ever a time that we needed to preserve the Word of God, it's a time we're living in right now. Are you hearing me? If there's ever a time that we took heed to that precious Word of God, It's the time we're living in now. At one time, I believe, the Bible was considered one of the the most sold and printed books in the United States. But I believe since then it has dropped off from the number one selling list. I mean, it can't compete with Harry Potter. (laughs) Come on in here now. I mean, it can't compete with Left Behind. Oh, I just left some of you behind right there. (laughs) 
Ow! Are you hearing me? I don't believe no, there ain't no such thing as a tribulation force. Are you hearing me? There ain't no such thing as an underground church where people's going to get saved like that. I don't believe my Bible tells it that way. Unless the Spirit of God draws a man, you can't be saved. And when the church goes, the Spirit goes. If you never have a chance, God help your soul to even make it after the rapture, you'll give your life. But I'll tell you this, if you can't serve God now while you've got grace, you'll not serve God with a blade on your neck. You'll not serve God with a gun to your head. Are you hearing me? If you won't sell out now, you won't sell out then. sell out now. You're not going to confess him then. If you won't give him your life now, you're not going to give your life then. You think you're going to give your life for him when your baby's laying there crying, wanting something to eat, and the only way you can feed him is if you take the mark. If you can't deny, I feel the Holy Ghost. It's not in my notes, but it's on God's notes. If you can't deny ungodliness in the flesh while there is grace abounding in this house, do you think when grace leaves this place, you're going to serve Him? Now is the accepted time. While God's dealing with men, while the Spirit is striving, because He'll not always strive. What's that word strive? He'll not always struggle. When you go towards sin, He's not always going to try to roadblock you. He's not going to try to stop you. He's not going to try to woo you. What are you going to do when the Spirit's gone? What are you going to do when the Word of God is finally finished and settled? And there's no more to be said. There's no more messages to be preached. Oh, God, there's no more songs to be sung. I mean, there's no more camp meetings to go to. There's no more youth camps, boys, to decide to get right for a few days. Some of you need to make a clean break. Josiah went against all odds. Josiah went against his raising. He went against everything that seemed natural. Amen. And yet, in the midst of all that, he sought out the Word of God and said, Me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. great obstacles that he had to climb over. He had to go against everything he was taught, everything he seen, everything that he knew that was normal. But there was something about that word. There was just something about that word that brought hope. It inspired him. When he looked out and seen all the ungodliness that his kingdom was involved in. Now you've got to realize, he didn't start finding the Word of God till he was 18. So from 8 to 18, he reigned over Jerusalem. He didn't really know exactly what to do. He is sitting on the throne that proceeded by two wicked men. <laughs> and something just didn't feel right to him. This don't, this, this don't seem right. There's got to be more than this. <laughs> oh, God. There's some of you, you sit right here in these services, you've heard the Word of God, and it's pricked your heart. And you know, 
You need to be deeper than what you are. <laughs> when we get past your pushed out lip and your mad attitude deep down inside, that word's a prick in your heart. You know what us preachers are telling you are right. <laughs> huh? Come on here now. If I was to catch this box of tissues on fire and try to sit it in your lap, would you hold it? Would you hold it? Would you pass it to one of these younger boys to let them hold it? Why not? Huh? It'll burn them. It'll burn them. But yet when we pull back the covers on sin and we try to show you the path you're going and to leave things alone, and then you want to get mad and roll your lip out. But you know, deep down in your heart, it's going to burn you. Are you hearing me? You know, deep down in your heart, it's going to lead you down a bad road. Are you hearing me? You know it ain't right. Whether you want to admit it or not, deep down in your heart, the Word of God strikes a melody. I said the word of God strikes a melody. Why is that? We were created in the image and the likeness of God. And deep down inside of each and every one of us, there's a place there where God should dwell. And when that word speaks, it goes through every door, every passage, and it goes to that one door that holds it all. <laughs> that door that you guard so close, and you won't let Mama in. I feel the Holy Ghost right at that door right now. There's a door in your heart. You won't let the pastor in. You won't even let your closest friends in because that is your true being. That is the true expression of yourself. And when that word of God goes forth, he goes through all the junk. He goes through all the facades. He cuts through all the chain. Ah, oh, sweet lamb of God. He goes through all the garbage and goes right to that deepest, most inner part. And he goes through that door strikes up a heavenly note and it causes us to look to our maker and say, God's talking to me. Oh, God's talking to me. The creator and lover of my soul is talking to me. It's different than when Brother Jerry talks to you. It's different than when Brother Noah talks to you. It's that undistinguishable voice of the Word of God. Josiah is a perfect example of that. How many of us have seen a sinner come into our services? Rank sinner, knows nothing about God, complete heathen, never been taught, never seen, doesn't know anything. But you let Calvary be preached. And God talks to him. And he instantly, without realizing it, looks up to God and says, Somebody's talking to me. I feel something like a wheel inside of a wheel here today. Oh, you may be able to tune my voice out. You may be able to put aside what I'm saying. But when God talks to you, when God speaks to you, it goes to bed with you. It goes to work with you. It goes to school with you. I said when the word of God speaks to a life, it takes notice. Oh, I feel something in this place today. That little Samaritan woman, that woman there at that well that day, According to the religion of that day, she was a dog. She wasn't worthy. But when the Word spoke to her, what was her words? Never a man, never a man spake like that man. <laughs> I've had a lot of priests talk to me. I've had a lot of people talk to me. But when that man spoke to me, like he knew exactly 
where I was at. I mean, he practically told me everything that I ever done. Come and see that man. Come and see him. Huh? The greatest day of her life was when the Lord looked at his disciples and said, I must need to go to Samaria. He took a complete circle backtrack around the route they was heading because somebody needed to hear the Word of God speak to them. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> the priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees, they weren't getting the job done. It was like the blind leading the blind. But she had the Word of God visit her that day. Oh, God. Josiah's sitting there as they begin to read the Word of God. He said, something's doing something inside of me. Baal ain't never did this to me. Oh, God. Them pagan gods, Asherah, all those gods never did nothing to me. I ain't never felt like I'm feeling right now. Are you hearing me? Oh, God. When Christian in that book of Pilgrim's Progress began to hear about the place he could go and load his burden. Amen. He was weighted down to where he almost couldn't make the journey. Are you hearing me? But when he got there, past the wicked gate up the hill, and saw the cross in the empty tomb, are you hearing me? When the Word of God and the reality of it was made manifest, the Bible says that the burden just fell off of his back. Are you hearing me? Ah, oh, sweet lamb of God. I'll tell you what some of you need. You need to slow down for about two seconds and allow the Word of God to pick that heart. Allow God to talk to you. Allow God to work it out of you. Allow the Word to cut it off of you. And you shall be free. turn aside and you spurn the word of God you do it to your own destruction oh God Josiah in the midst of our repairing the house of God we found a book Read it, King. Read it. Oh, God. It's got words in there that our witchcraft books don't have. All the sorcery in the world has never touched me like the words of this book has touched me. Josiah read it for himself. Him renting his clothes and bowing down as a form of humbling himself to God. Sort of like a, a, a form of repentance. Huh? He realized he needed what was in that book. If my kingdom's going to get turned around, if all this wickedness is going to get abolished, I'm going to have to let that word go through that door right down in there. I don't understand it. I don't know nothing about it. But it's speaking to me like nothing else has spoke to me before. Go find a prophetess. Go find somebody that's got this God in their life. And tell me about the words. You know what you young people ought to be doing today when every time a preacher preaches, when it rubs your hide raw, you need to stand up and say, Preacher, tell me about the word. Don't let me die and go to hell. Pull the scales off my eyes. Let God reveal himself to me. You hearing me? How are you going to hear the word? It's by the foolishness of preaching. If you won't accept the man of God, if you reject the man of God, you're rejecting the word of God. You're cutting off your lifeline. If you get an odd against the preacher, if you get mad at the preacher, if you get mad at the church, if you get mad at the house of God, you're cutting off your lifeline. Rich man opened up his eyes in hell, being in torments. Plural, torments. Lazarus, 
go warn my brethren. Tell them not to come near. This place is terrible. It's awful. Father Abraham said, silence. They've got Moses and the prophets. If they'll not hear Moses... If they won't hear Moses and they won't hear the prophets, they're not even going to pay attention to one, though he was raised from the dead. I mean, you can chalk it up and say, the preacher's just a-hating on me. The preacher's just a-screaming at me. He's giving me what his version of it is. You say whatever you want. Amen. I can't speak for nobody else, but I know I not dare get in this pulpit unless I have sought God. I don't want it to be my wisdom. I don't want it to be my words. I don't want it to be my theology. I want to know what the Word of God has to say about it. I want to find God's heart. I want to find God's heartbeat. Somebody says, I want to know the will of God. Get to know His Word. I said, fall in love with His Word. We got young people running around making life-threatening decisions, and they have not prayed and read God's Word. And they're running from preacher to preacher saying, counsel me, tell me what I need to do. Well, Brother Jerry don't tell me what I want to hear. I'll go see what Brother Noah has to say about it. Well, Brother Noah don't tell me what I want to hear. I'll go see what Pastor Bailey has to say about it. Well, if that don't work, I'll attack the traveling evangelist when he comes by and ask him what God's will for my life is. Oop, there it is. What does God want me to do? Hey, hey. Brother Hyde, what's God's will for my life? Tell me something. Hey, hey, Pastor Bailey, who am I supposed to marry? Uh, ring a ling ling, dinner time. <laughs> Come on in here now. I'm talking, we have an eight-year-old boy here who's a king. Think about it. Give me a young man. Who's eight years old in this building? You're eight years old, Brady? You're nine? That's good enough. Come here. Here's King Josiah. <laughs> boy, that's a thought, ain't it? <laughs> My life's in Brady's hands. God help us all. <laughs> I'm just kidding, guys. Be my buddy. Huh? Here's the king, folks. This is the ones responsible for everything in our lives, right here. He's got control of the economy. Who would trust an eight year old with their finances? They could probably do better anyway. <laughs> He's in charge of where we're going to go to church at. He's in charge of where we're going to work at, where we're going to trade at. I mean, he is the man right here. And I didn't read one time from the age of 8 to 18 where Josiah called in Hilakai or Shaphan and say, how am I supposed to run this kingdom? Should I kill this Murderer, or shall I let him go? I mean, tell me how to run my country here. Instead, he said, come here, boys. I want you to go down, count all the silver in the house of God, and you give it to them workers, and you tell them to build that house back. Now, <clears throat> I'm not trying to make light. Sit down here for me, buddy. You sit down. I'm not trying to make light of these men's counsel. I'm not trying to say that there ain't times in our lives when we need to get advice. I'm not saying that. But there's a lot of you running around that you're asking everybody 
but if I needed help in this life in a natural sense and I asked everybody but my dad over there he would be hurt why didn't you come to me son I brought you in this world huh I fed you for 17, 18 years I clothed you, I took care of you Huh? He didn't run after every soothsayer. He didn't call the magicians in. He didn't call the witch doctors in and say, conjure me up a familiar spirit and tell me how to lead this nation like my granddad did and like my dad did. No. He said, boys, I'm, like, I'm going to the house of God. I'm going to go to the house of God. And when he got to the house of God, he had heard the word of God. And when he heard the word of God, he knew the direction he needed to take for his life. And that's what I'm trying to get to some of you. That's the point I'm trying to make to you young people today. Amen. You are living right now in the best possible place you can be. You've got counsel. You've got help. You've got instruction. Don't spurn the word of God. This is more than a book of parables. This is more than a book of stories and illustrations. This is a book about real men and real women that faced real challenges. Sometimes they failed and sometimes they excelled. But the fact of the matter is there's one thing that stood true in every one of their lives. They knew who they could depend on. Amen. They knew who they could trust in. They knew who they could lean upon in the midst of trouble. David wrote all kinds of verses about it. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Amen. He told about how God's a pavilion. He told about how God's a high tower and how that we can run into him and we can find safety. Are you hearing me? There's one thing about this book right here. There will not be any issue in your life that this book can't deal with. Are you hearing me? It can tell you how to get saved. It can tell you how to get sanctified. It will lead you to the Holy Ghost. It will help you find a good mate that's going to keep you. It will help you in every life's decision. It'll tell you about your finances. It'll tell you how to treat your employers. Come on here now. It'll tell you how to dress. It'll tell you how to eat. Oh, thank God in heaven. I said, this book right here is our roadmap, our instruction manual. It's the issues of life. Tell you how to act. Tell you how not to act. It'll tell you where to find entertainment and where to stay away from entertainment. This is a mighty, mighty book that I'm holding in my hand today. No wonder David said, Thy word is mine heart. That I might not sin against thee. And even when David done wrong, the word of God pricked him and showed him the error of his way. And he said, I'm sorry, Lord. And once again, he picked up the word and he walked on. This word will show you how to get up after you fall. As a matter of fact, this word encourages you to get up after you fall. Oh God. Like what the Brother Brent said yesterday. God ain't no one-shot God. This book is full of great men that made a lot of mistakes. But all they had to do was turn back to God and confess. And then start walking after Him again. Yeah, there was still trouble. Sometimes they still had to face things. 
that when they stay true to this book, this book stay true to them. I didn't give no title, but if I was a title this, I'd like to title it, We Need a Love for the Word of God. Back in the old times of the reformist, they didn't have 100 mile an hour songs. They just preached the word. If this word can't break it, no 100 mile an hour songs is going to do anything for you. That's why I don't have much for people that can only shout when the singing singing. Because I've seen a lot of people that don't need to be singing that sings and people just shout anyway. It amazed me what Brother Noah said last night about that woman in his church he was talking about. When she began to speak in tongues and go over to the door and say, Get out, devil. You know, most holiness churches, everybody would have been on their feet shouting. But the Word knew where her heart really was. And dealt with the man of God and said, It ain't of me. Everybody likes to shout. There's times when you're shouting, when you know deep down in your heart you really need to be still and listen. I'm going to say something here. I don't mean to be dousing anything out here or, or being acting like I know everything because I don't. But it troubles me when we schedule a good man of God to come preach revivals for us and we want to shout four nights out of five. Why do we call it revival? Huh? Or somebody decides to have a healing line before the preacher gets up. How are you going to get healed? Faith. How do you get faith? <laughs> Come on in here now. One old revangelist, I ain't going to mention no names. He said, I went to a church one time. They shouted three nights in a row. I never mounted the pulpit one time from the first night, three nights in. He said, I that last, that third night, I went over to the pastor, shook his hand, and said, thanks for asking me to come, brother, but it's apparent to me you don't need revival. Amen. You guys are shouting a house down every night. Amen. You don't need me here. i got to go somewhere else where somebody needs to hear from God. Come on in here. I said, come on in here a minute. Blink at me, will you? Amen. Hello. I said, some of you need to lay the shout down for a minute because your shout ain't helping you. Because when you quit shouting, you keep on sinning. Ah, oh, are you hearing me? But if you listen to the Word of God, if you listen to the Word of God, it'll reach down in there. It'll yank out that root of sin to where it'll give you something to shout about. about to pull me out, Brother Ivy. <laughs> huh? I'm going to be flat honest with you. There's been times in the past where I just didn't want to reckon with it. I didn't want to deal with it. The Spirit of God talked to me. The Word of God pricked my heart. I just didn't want to deal with it. I didn't want to think about it. Service get hot. Hey. Huh? I know y'all ain't never done that. There's been times. <laughs> there's been times the preachers just plowed my corn row down, and I went over there and tried to sing an altar call song. <laughs> 
Yeah, like I'm going to cause somebody to feel conviction to come to the altar. <laughs> what I really needed to do was lay the microphone. Sing with a clear conscience. That's what some of you need to do. You need to lay the microphone down. Let somebody else sing so you can pray through. Well, we're having revival, <laughs> ain't we? Come on in here now. Some of you boys need to lay them music down. I ain't dumb. Well, you know. You know what? I used to abuse that guitar when I was growing up. I used to hide behind it. What The preacher would skin my hide, but I wouldn't lay it down. Huh. They need me up here. I ain't going to pray. I'll pray when I get home. What about the anointing that's supposed to be flowing through your body and your fingers trying to reach souls? Come on in here now. Ease on in here and help me. I promise I won't, I'll won't. i let you up before you get breathing all the way anyway. Uh, come on here now. There's been a lot of times. You listen to me. I'm going to make a statement here. And I don't want you to fall out with me. But I remember as a 15-year-old boy, I backslid on God holding on to a bass guitar. Are you hearing me? Oh, are you hearing me? I said, I'm backslid. Hold on to a bass guitar. I said, you need more than a talent. You... I said, you need more than a talent. You need to let the word of God work in your life. There have been a lot of people walk off from the microphone singing and go out and sin. There have been a lot of preachers preach the message that they'll never, the last message they'll ever preach on this earth and walk out to a motel room. Come on in here. You want to know why? Because somewhere we shut the Word of God out of our lives. We got too big to hear the story. We didn't allow it to hold us no more. I tell you what we need. We don't need bigger music. We don't need larger crowds. But we need somebody to get a hold of a love for the Word of God. It'll keep you when the guitar's out of tune. It'll keep you when the 100 mile hour song runs out of gas. <laughs> We're talking about the Word of God. Why are we so afraid to yield ourselves to the Word of God? You know, Jesus, according to the Bible, was the Word of Made flesh. When you reject Christ, you reject the Word of God. There's some of you, you will not get help this week. There's going to be some of you, even after this message, you're going to shout this week, you're going to sing this week, but you're not going to get help this week. Every time the word is brought forth, you draw back. It's like you'll serve God up to a certain point, but you're drawing the line. I told some of our young people up home seeking for the Holy Ghost. They wasn't seeking for the Holy Ghost. And I got to praying about it one time. I was like, Lord... You know, I don't understand why they don't want the Holy Ghost. I mean, I just don't understand that. I don't understand some of them being saved for 20 years and not having a desire to want to get the Holy Ghost. I don't understand that. Can somebody explain that to me? 
God got to dealing with me. And I got to watching some things. And then I remembered. The Lord said, remember what it was like when you sought for the Holy Ghost? Think about that for a moment. So I began to think about it. And there was this little process in between salvation and the baptism that dawned on me. They're all right being saved, and they wouldn't care having the Holy Ghost if they could just step over sanctification to get it. <laughs> if I could just get around <laughs> sanctification, <laughs> huh? I wouldn't mind speaking in tongues if I didn't have to mark up. So I begin to think about it. When I began seeking for the Holy Ghost, great God, I was giving up everything. <laughs> I was honest with the Lord. I wanted something. God, if there's something in my life that shouldn't be there, deal with me. Things begin to fly off of me like crazy. Come on in here now. I quit listening to some of the music I was listening to. I quit going to some of the places that I was going to. I quit talking some of the talk I was talking. I quit acting some of the ways I was acting. I quit wearing some of the things I was wearing. Ooh. I quit watching all the things. Notice how I changed that there. I quit watching all the things I was watching. Me and Sister Tina, now don't fall out with us, but when we first got married, you know, I was just, uh, I was hard-headed. I mean, my dad, I mean, he couldn't do nothing with me. I was like, you know, it's bad sometimes. And I know y'all don't believe that now. I'm just so happy-go-lucky, y'all. Well, you wouldn't have liked me before I got saved. I was a little punk. <laughs> yeah, I was. I mean, I just ain't saying that. I was bad news. <laughs> Me and old Sister Tina, I brought my new wife home. Oh, yeah. I mean, all of 17 years old. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think nobody should try that. Amen. <laughs> don't try it, all right? I already told my boy, don't come to me 18 years old tell me how much you're in love. I don't want to hear it. Go get a job. Amen. Do something first. <laughs> Don't start out like that. Amen. I couldn't even spell love when I was 17. Amen. I couldn't even spell responsibility either. That's for sure. That's too long. Hey, my dad had to whoop me out of house to go to work. <laughs> Come on here now. Let me get back on my subject. <laughs> what was I talking about? Oh, yeah. Me and Sister Tina. Oh, yeah. Now, I know this ain't this is a small change now, but it was a big deal when I was growing up. I had a big 19-inch color TV that would sit on my bed. Every night. I couldn't hardly get up for school because every night, you know, I had to watch David Letterman. Huh? Every night. <laughs> Saturday Night Live. I mean, I, you know, I had to watch all this crazy stuff. I mean, every night. And I remember the night I prayed through and come home and said, Sister Tina, honey, we got to get rid of that thing. <laughs> oh, come on here now. I remember the day I was in church. I mean, I was walking toward the house of God. I thought I was going to be manly, you know, and get me and my wife an engagement ring. I wasn't raised with that stuff. But I'm an old man now. And I'm buying my baby a ring. I want everybody to know she's my wife. It ain't like they was lined up in line. I mean, <laughs> I think everybody knew. It ain't like I was some, you know, something spectacular to get a hold of. Amen. <laughs> hey, hold on now. Y'all's taking that wrong. <laughs> I meant me. I meant me. <laughs> Lord, Brother Randy, I just lost it all right there. <laughs> I don't know if I can get this one back. 
I don't know if I can get this one back. <laughs> All right. Word of God. Amen. It'll keep you. Amen. So anyway, I had that ring on there. Oh, yeah. I was proud of it. You know? I was proud of it. And all of a sudden, the Lord began to deal with my heart. Huh? You know better than that stuff, son. You know better than that. Before I knew it, that little band of gold, Brother Lloyd, it looked like it was taking up my whole hand. God was convicting me. I yanked that thing off, and we did it together, and we, and we got rid of them. We did. We got rid of them. We didn't even put them in a little hope chest in case we might change our minds later. I don't believe in wearing britches, but I got a pair just in case. God delivered me of it, but I'm going to hide it just in case. He changes his mind later. No, we got rid of it. Because if God said no, he means no forever. No. Amen. But the point that I'm really trying to make is there was a process there that I had to go through. And God dealt with my heart and said, the reason why these young, some of these young people ain't seeking after me is because they don't want to deny the flesh and do what it takes to go to the next level. But when you get a love for the Word of God, there won't be no boy cute enough. There won't be no girl pretty enough. There'll, be not, there'll not be a TV show entertaining enough. There'll not be a Kings Island ride big enough. There'll not be a baseball team large enough. There'll not be one fashion, one trend of this world that's cool enough that'll cause you to let go of the Word of God. The most miserable person in the world is the person that has just enough of God to make him the most miserable person in the world. Huh? This book is a book of wholeness. Seek me with your whole heart. Serve me with your whole heart, with all thy strength, all thy might, every part of you, every bit of you. God is a God of all, or God is a God of none. We need a love. I went home last night. I was joking and laughing with the brethren and enjoying the fellowship. But deep down in my heart, the words, and, and, and not just the content, because it was good, and I, and I agree, but it was that word, Brother Noah, kept pounding in me. And all night long, I would catch myself, even when I was talking with my brethren, saying, God, do I need to mark up somewhere? <laughs> God, I'm not too big. Deal with me. <laughs> While my boys was laying on that halter last night, I'm proud of them for standing up there, walking up there like that. I fell down on my face over in that pew, and I said, God, help me lead my family. Don't ever let me shut myself out to your word, God. Help me be the leader. Help me be the man of God I need to be. Make me the Christian. Make me the preacher, God. There's something about that word. There was a bunch of dry bones strewn across the desert. And a man of God began to speak the word of God to them. And they began to form living beings again. Are you hearing me? If you allow the word of God to touch a place in your life, it will bring you alive. You'll have such a joy in serving God you never knew existed when you allow that word to envelop your life. Don't just go halfway with God. Don't just go part way. Allow that word to strike you. Allow that word to bring you to the place to where you can get strength. If you ever get to the place, young person, an older person in life, to where the word of God can't touch you, 
and you think you're too big to kneel down and ask God to help you, you are a lost cause. There will be no amount of preaching or praying that's going to be able to turn your mind when you reach that point. If the Word of God preached or spoken will not prick your heart, you're in a sad way, my friend. As we stand all over this building and they come and get us a song, I know this ain't much. I know it's not much. Amen. But I'm just doing my part. Amen. Against all odds, Josiah should have went down in the history of the kings just like his fathers, going after idols, chasing after ungodliness. But he found a light in the house of God. (laughs) Brother Lloyd, he found a light. I got the utmost respect. I was telling somebody the other day. I said, I am so proud. I'm glad I'm so proud to know Brother Lloyd Bailey, and I'm not just saying that. A lot of you don't know, but when he took this church, it wasn't shouting hip pocket high. Huh? It'd been through it. It'd been battled. And he's come up here, and I've been here before. God's dealt with that man, and he's preached, and he said things that has offended people. Not in a wrong way, but because it was the truth. And he's not held favor. It was your family or his family. He's preached the truth. And I want to give honor to the men of God that will stand up. I appreciate Brother Noah for the way he preached last night. You might not have agreed with what he says. But if, if you couldn't tell the man was preaching with love and with a burden last night, then there's something wrong with you. And what is wrong with you is you don't want to let the Word of God in you. Because you like getting into them chat rooms. You like that lust that's all over you. Are you hearing me? You are where you're at today because you choose to be there. Are you hearing me? You've not asked God to forgive you because you like that sin. You like petting it. You like talking to it. You like the way it makes you feel when nobody else is around. But when you really love God, you'll say, God, forgive me and get it out. Amen. The Word of God. We need a love for the Word of God. I want them to begin to play and begin to sing. And if you're here today, and there's something in your life you know God's been dealing with in you. You know God's been speaking to you. But you have refused to let go of it. I'm going to ask you, why would you cause yourself harm? God's not trying to harm you. God's not trying to hurt you. God's trying to raise you up and make something out of your life. God's trying to keep you from a lot of sorrow. God's trying to keep you from a world of hurt. We preach hard. And people cause it hard. We preach hard sometimes the way we do because we're trying to warn people. Don't go that way. Don't live like that because that kind of life is going to produce death spiritually and sometimes physically. But if you're here and there's something in your life, an element in your life, a place in your life that you've not let go of yet and God's dealt with you this week about it, I'm going to ask you to allow the Word of God to talk to you one more time. And not just talk to you, but allow it to come in and take care of that problem. While they sing, would there be one? Would there be one that will not care what anybody else is going to think or what anybody else is going to say? And say, Brother Jerry, there's just some places in my life and there's places in my heart that I've not given God authority over yet. And I want to ask God to come in and take control. Would there be one? I know I've not missed it this morning. I know I've preached exactly what God's given me to preach. Would you not heed? Don't turn away from the Word of God this morning. This Word will keep you when there's nothing else around to keep you. This Word will preserve you when everything else fails. In the midst of an ungodly world, In the midst of pure darkness, there's still a light that shines in the house of God. 
Would you come to that light this morning? Don't be like the men that Jesus talked about and said that they chose to have light rather than darkness. Don't be like that. Would you come this morning? Would there be one? Would there be a girl? Would there be a boy? Would there be a young man, a young woman? That say, Brother Jerry, I want to sell out all the way to God today. This large of a crowd, there's not one individual that doesn't feel God dealing with their heart. Is that what you're telling me? This size of a crowd. You're here this morning. Why don't you allow God to complete that work in your life? Why don't you allow the Word of God to take you to that next level? To help you raise above it. I'm going to hold it for just a few minutes. I want to tell you something this morning. I'm not being boastful here. God knows my heart. I'm not because I feel like I'm the least among every one of these brothers right here. You're not rejecting me this morning. You're rejecting God's Word. You're rejecting God's Word. You don't have to be a young person. If you're just in this building, God's dealing with you. Come to this altar. Don't turn away the Word of God from your life. It's your only hope. All right. I'm going to ask all that will and gather in. Amen. Let's pray.